good evening. How's everybody doing? All right. Well, um, so I'm glad to and thankful for uh, everyone uh, being here. Uh, Matt, thank you for uh, inviting me to sit on this very important panel. And um, the title um, of the, the actual panel discussion is, I think, really important because I think it's important to connect with where we came from and uh, I don't think the, the struggle, at least on the left, has stopped. And um, so I think partially uh, my own thinking comes out of, of well, my experience, my uh, activism before Mike Brown was killed um, in uh, anti-war uh, activism, pro-peace activism, uh, as a graduate student after 9-11, uh, my anti-war activism uh, against uh, the wars that uh, George Bush uh, started. Uh, and so when Mike Brown was killed, um, I, I was in St. Louis. I actually had just came back from D.C. where I had taken my students to uh, a protest uh, against the Israeli occupation. It was right around that time, uh, the Israeli occupation of Palestine. And I was in St. Louis, uh, it was my mother's birthday, August the 9th, and uh, I was telling some friends about the, the protests that uh, we were engaged in, and he told me that I should uh, come out uh, to Ferguson, which was right around the corner from my parents' house, where I grew up at. Um, and after uh, that, uh, we went out and I stayed out, and I ended up, that year at the time I was teaching at Bucknell, and I ended up staying uh, in St. Louis uh, for some time, and uh, engaging and learning from this uh, organic movement that was beginning. And uh, a few weeks later, um, Kajimi Pao, um, he was gunned down across the street from my parents' house. And I, I remember because I was standing outside and um, a colleague of mine called me, he asked, you know, what kind of work are you doing uh, with the protests? And, and it, it took me for a loop because I had my academic hat on. I was going out interviewing and protesting some, but mostly, uh, you know, doing the professor thing, uh, thinking about what I was going to write about it. Uh, but at the same time, I was moved by a new kind of movement um, that I think did not adhere to the politics of respectability of, or at least part of the movement uh, in the 60s, but uh, that was a continuation and building on that and the black power movements and the free political prisoners movement. And one of the things that came out of uh, my own involvement in the protests uh, and that sparking conversation with the colleague was all of a sudden I began uh, seeing how I could really engage and be an educator in the movement. And so uh, one of the things that came across uh, the listservs of uh, people who had uh, gotten out in the streets was somebody had mentioned truth and reconciliation. And we had been talking about that. Um, among my group of friends and colleagues, and one of the, the responses was, fuck reconciliation. And I started thinking about that, and uh, one of the reasons why it was said was because when you think about truth and reconciliation, some of the perceptions of it, uh, at least uh, among many people in my community and communities uh, around the world is that it's this blanket uh, forgiveness, but that's also perception as well. But it's also, when you think about truth and reconciliation, it's a post-conflict 
process. Mm -hmm. So how do you have truth and reconciliation when we're still being killed? And we essentially, and over time, came up with uh, the notion of truth telling. And, and the uh, brother Raymond I take to, uh, Turner, in, in your uh, poem, you, you said um, truth is, uh, is, is the weapon of mass instruction. And for us, we saw truth telling, this notion of truth telling in all the literature describes it as this, as well as the first step of a moral inventory. So on one hand, and, and so we began um, having conversations with folks around the world, uh, had even been in touch with Bishop Tutu in South Africa, and we were interested in truth and reconciliation, but how do we get from truth to reconciliation? And we know that structural change is necessary for us to get there. Um, and so uh, we, we essentially created a quasi-commission. And uh, we, we didn't want to be a truth commission because uh, commissions, uh, well, number one, we're commissioned out. There's a Ferguson Commission. There's all kinds of institutional projects and uh, that. Uh, we know true commissions as a post-conflict tool is often a tool to keep the state together. Uh, and and it it's can be a, uh, a band-aid over digging up and actually changing and reordering societies. And so one of the things that our uh, approach has been is truth telling uh, as a way that underheard voices uh, get out, and that we learn from people with tattoos on their neck, uh, people who curse, uh, people who don't have, uh, you know, suits on and uh, are not interested in kneeling and praying, uh, but have the spirit. And and since we began processing, have even began educating themselves more about the movement and educating us. Uh, the, the, I'm a little bit older than them. Uh, but uh, one of the things that, um, that came to me uh, as I was thinking about this um, is uh, a poem uh, by uh, uh, Amiri Baraka. And I thought about it uh, because I, I was thinking how truth telling um, is, on one hand, uh, a kind of dramatization of issues. Right? We hear truth telling in the poetry and the songs uh, that we talk about. We hear truth telling on the streets. Uh, we need radical truth telling, but um, I think we need truth telling that highlights uh, this intersectional struggle uh, led by women uh, to, I think, disrupt the blindness uh, and ignorance and challenge and transform. And so I'm going to just read a few lines from uh, Amiri Baraka's poem, uh, Revolutionary Theater, because protest and truth telling to some extent is theater. Um, but the revolutionary theater should force change. It should be change. All their first faces turned into the lights and you work on them black nigger magic and cleanse them at having seen the ugliness. And if the beautiful see themselves, they will love themselves. We are preaching virtue again. But by the way, the mean now, what seems the most constructive use of the word. The revolutionary theater must expose, show up the insides of these humans, look into black skulls. White men will cower before this theater because it hates them, because they have been trained to hate. The revolutionary theater must hate them for hating, for presuming with their technology to deny the supremacy of the spirit. They will all die because of this. The revolutionary theater must teach them their deaths. It must crack their faces open 
to the mad cries of the poor. It must teach them about silence and about the truth lodged there. It must kill any god anyone names except common sense. It should stagger through the universe, correcting, insulting, preaching, spitting craziness, but craziness taught to us in our most rational moments. People must be taught to trust true scientists, knowers, diggers, oddballs, and that the holiness of life is the constant possibility of widening of consciousness. And they must be incited to strike back against any agency that attempts to prevent this widening. The revolutionary theater must accuse and attack anything that can be accused and attacked. It must accuse and attack because it is the theater of victims. It looks at the sky with the victim's eyes and moves the victims to look at their strength through their minds and in their bodies.
found it compelling to go to something that was called the Take Back the Night March. My friends were all going. I went, and there I was, grown up, anti-racist, um, feminist, unself-conscious, marching right through the black neighborhood of New Haven with a whole group of white women yelling and discussing things, and I completely experienced myself as a vigilante. And I, at that point, decided I had to leave New Haven and go to New York City because there had to be a way to be an anti-racist and be a feminist at the same time. And I was pretty sure I could find it in New York City. I went to New York City, I went to the Lower East Side, and there on a the street corner were these older white women talking about the liberation of Zimbabwe and feminism and fighting the Klan. And I was instantly 